Thank you. We were planning on having a really detailed discussion because we really want to hear what each of you have to say, of course, about your own experiences, but uh, we are really mindful of time. What we'd like to do, first of all, is invite our panellists to introduce themselves and, of course, the background. We have heard from our Lord Mayor from Parramatta, but um, I'd really like to hear a little bit more about, um, I suppose, where you've come from and your own interest and involvement with the refugee community too. Oh, we're just having a joke about the fact that I knew that if I sat on the end, I'd have to go first. So <laughs> I should have sat in the middle. Um, look, I'm going, not going to um, speak for too long because you have already heard from me. So I have been Lord Mayor of the City of Parramatta since January, and this is my second term as a councillor on the City of Parramatta Council. I have lived in Parramatta for over 25 years, and my background, actually, where I come from is Tasmania. I grew up in Tasmania and um, the island state and moved here to New South Wales when I was 18. So um, I actually um, ha you know, have found my home here in New South Wales with my, my family, met my husband and, and had our own family. And it's been wonderful being a part of Western Sydney. For me, the importance of our refugee community is, is no different than any other members of our community. It's so important that we, as um, people, uh, people that live in Western Sydney, um, embrace each other and the contributions that everyone can make to our community. In terms of the challenges that, our, that those who um, are currently refugees and those of you who have been refugees um, and moved to Australia, it's so important that we as governments, whether they be local, state or federal, ensure that we provide the services that you need to be able to live fulfilling lives and to be able to move on through the challenges that you have. Whether or not that be through health issues, whether or not that be mental health or physical issues, um, ac equal access to education, opportunities for your whole family, opportunities for your own families to reunite with you here in Australia. All of these things are really important and all levels of government need to work together to ensure that we can deliver what is required and what we as, as, good, as good forms of government can do to support all members of our community. Because it should not matter what your experiences have been and how you came to be in Australia, whether or not you have come here from another land or whether or not you've been born here, everyone should have access to those same opportunities. And that's why I feel that it's important as the Lord Mayor of the City of Parramatta that at a local government level we do what we can to support everybody, to give everyone those same opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm actually going to introduce my co-MC first, Simon Kogel, because when I heard about his own background, for me it really does encapsulate what we're trying to do today, which is, of course, be in the spirit of social cohesion with um, our communities from Southeast Asia. But the refugee experience has, of course, happened to many other communities and many, many um, centuries ago now. So, Simon, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, thank you, Samana. Yes, I'm, um, I'm um, quite a, a multicultural background, I, I guess I put it. My, um, my great-grandparents were Jewish in Russia and Eastern Europe, and in the, around 100 years ago, actually, they had to flee Russia and Eastern Europe because of discrimination, and, um, uh, and so they fled to the UK, and they couldn't speak any English. And, uh, and they knew nobody there, so it, it was a, um, what that has taught me is that the plight of people fleeing oppressive regimes and human rights is something that has gone on for not just hundreds but thousands of years and it's something that we're still grappling with today. And uh, from the UK, my parents came here as free migrants, so I suppose my history is part 
forced and, and chosen migration. But it, it makes me realise that uh, the experiences of people leaving their homelands, uh, whether they're forced to or whether they choose to, that there's still a lot of settling in that's required and having community to support them is very important. So I, I might ask my uh, lovely person next to me here, um, Darby Eck. I, I know, Darby is a leading public servant and has done extremely well for herself in her career and is a wonderful example of, of somebody that's come here with her family and has studied and worked hard and made a life for herself and her family. And, and Darby, I'd be interested to hear from you and I might, we might just ask all the panellists to keep their comments to one or two minutes so we can squeeze everybody in. But Darby, I'd be interested to hear from you what has been, um, and, and in keeping with the theme of healing, uh, for Refugee Week, what, what have been some of your experiences in terms of um, coming here, developing your life and seeing more refugees come through uh, in, in more modern, challenging times? What would be some of you, what's been some of your experience and your advice to them? Thank you, Simon. Um, how do you do, everybody? Very nice to meet you uh, and very happy for the opportunity to be here. And thank you to the Laos community for organising and hosting so that we can be together and we can connect not only within our community but across <coughs> community and we can share and support each other so that we can be stronger. So thank you for that. Um, I, I have been very fortunate that as a refugee, came into, I actually went and lived in uh, New Zealand and grew up and went, and, and went to university there. I actually come to Australia for a holiday after my graduation and then I found that this beautiful country, not saying that New Zealand is not beautiful as well, <laughs> um, but and then I fell in love with um, Sydney and then I decided, I told my parents that I'm not going back, I'm going to find a job and live here. And it took me six months and my money almost ran out before, <laughs> and luckily I found a job. But reflecting on my journey as a refugee child and kind of growing up in another country, um, we, we do struggle. Uh, you know, I, I didn't speak a, a word of English and I didn't have any education either because I was a child labor during the Civil War. My parents came here, uh, came to New Zealand. They had to work in the factory because they, didn't have, uh, they couldn't speak any language. My dad was a director, professional, couldn't use his skill. So because of the sacrifices my parents made, I had to respect and pay due to them. So I knew I had to have education. That was really important for us all. And those that are the refugee, we know how, it, how education is our freedom to our future. So I had to learn English and then I had to go to school. But at the same time, because I didn't have education, I had to memorize everything in order to get through to university. Um, so that is the challenge. I think growing up, we, our experience makes us really resilient. Right? So, and, and it's that resilience that makes us grow. We all have a choice. We come from very difficult experience, but we have a choice to make ourselves better, to contribute to all of these beautiful countries so that we can preserve the value we can preserve our freedom and the quality of life. Right? And that not only for ourselves, but for our future. So that's why I work at APRA, because I have a strong value connection to APRA. It's my opportunity to pay back to the community. So thank you. Thank you, Darby. And of course, resilience is a really important value as part of healing. So I'll give back to Samana to ask the next question. Thank you. Mr. Detsi Serua has been a very vocal and active member of the Lao community for many, many years, um, and he played a very important role in helping to resettle, or settle rather, the Lao um, refugee community. So, Mr. Detsi Serua, I would like to ask you, um, being someone who has been so involved in the refugee community, I admire your resilience and your determination and commitment, and you are very, very inspirational as with many of our elders who persist after all these years, who continue to work very hard for the refugee community. I would love to hear about what challenges you thought were the most significant in trying to establish, um, I suppose, a voice for the Lao refugee community here in Australia. And in what way do you feel you have been able to overcome that 
little voice of the Lao people to make a bigger contribution to this conversation about refugee experiences. Thank you, thank you. It's a long story, right? <laughs> I don't know how, how long I can talk. One minute. <laughs> oh, one minute. <laughs> Uh, first of all, uh, before I fled the country, I was a school teacher. And I just go straight to the point. Before I fled the country, I was educated in the U.S. And to be in the U.S., in Laos, under communism, is a CIA. So I was, spot I was spotted as number one as a CIA. Therefore, they try to do whatever they could to control me. So I was lucky to get my wife and one son out in time. That was in January 1997. Okay. I live under that regime for only more than a year. 77. How? 77. I said 1977, yes, yes, sorry. And then uh, under that regime, how the communists taught people, controlled people. When I got out, I was taken to Bangkok for debriefing by the CIA, you know, what was going on in Laos and so on. I forgot to use a coke machine only for one year under communism. That's how they force people to think, how they retrain people. That's how bad, how bad, how bad it was like that. I wanted to do a coke, and I don't know. I forgot, you know, it's, my mind just went out, went away to, to use a machine. That's how bad it was. Anyway, and then we came here in 1980. Right. From the second week of my arrival, I step in in the Lao community, helping my, helping my family, helping my friends, helping my uh, fellow refugees. When I came here, I was able to speak the language, but that said me that I was better than anyone else. We have to struggle to make a living. We have to struggle to find a job. We have to uh, get my son to school. And, and uh, when I work, when I became the member of the Lao community, I saw the biggest challenge is the newcomers, is the language. Those people, most of them, most of us couldn't speak English. So the, the first day I walked to Kapamata, and I was helping man, one of my friends to buy the uh, detergent, you know, soap, because they, they just couldn't get anywhere. That is the biggest problem. Okay. And we went back to the hostel. There were only eggs in the morning, a lot of eggs, right? And the rice wasn't cooked well. The, cup, the, 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 the rice in the, in the hostel wasn't cooked like us. It, it wasn't very cooked. I don't know why. And that was a, one of the biggest problems, you know, for the food. And when the refugees came here, the orientation before coming here was none, none. People brought their cooking, the old cooking utensils from the camp. And actually, when we got here, there was no need of anything like that, right? It's, it's all new, it's very, but that's how, how poor the orientation was at, at the time. And then the language was a problem. And then when, we go, when they went out to the community, they were facing a lot of problems. We were called Jing Chong. We were all Chinese in Kapamata Fairfield area. We were called Ching Chong. When we walk around the street, oh, there's more Ching Chong coming there. You know, that, that's how we, 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 we face. This is reality, right? So, so, and then, and then they try to make a living, get the kids to school. 
it's, it's very, very, uh, very difficult. And for us, there are few people that we could speak the language in the, in the office, in the community. We try so hard. And then uh, in the living, so when are you, at one time I, I got a call from a friend. What, what can I do? I have a dead cat in, under, my, under my home. It's something like that, you know, because it was something, everything was new, everything was new, they scared. The word freedom that came to their mind was nothing, nothing of the freedom. They were thinking that they were still under the communism, you know, everything was under control. They have to listen to the authorities, they have to be told to do something. They have to be told. So we try to help them, we try to educate them that living in Australia, when they first came, we had a lot of freedom. There was no Kong Lord, no, 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 no uh, village soldiers or something around, see. And it's a big problem, it's a big problem for, especially the Lao, you know. And uh, some people walk to the street and when they see the uh, the police in uniform, uh, they thought that the Lao Khmer is coming. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That's um, one of the things you mentioned. <clears throat> very powerful, very real stories. And one of the things you mentioned about the language I think is very key because it's not just the struggle with the refugees who have difficulty with the language, it's the language that is used against or about the refugees or the newly arrived people that can make things very difficult, of course, with those very offensive terms. And I like your comment about the food. I remember my mother telling me when she migrated here in the early 1960s that, from, uh, that there was like white bread, steak and chips. That was about it. But now we have wonderful cuisine. So that is a huge benefit that uh, all of our communities have brought to Australia. Now I'd like to turn to our youthful member on the panel. We have Christina Mao, from the Khmer Krom Youth Representative. And uh, before I ask you a question, Christina, um, would you like to share with us the, uh, the statement from the Honourable Michael Kirby, who is the Honourable Patron of the Khmer Krom Community Centre? And he, uh, I'll hand over to you to share that statement, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Christina, and I am a Khmer Krom Youth from Kampuchea Krom Cultural Centre. So this following message, sorry, this following message is from Australia's state man and a global person, the former High Court judge and a special UN High Human Rights representative to Cambodia in 1993. Also the honorary patron of the Khmer Ground Cultural Centre in Cabramatta since before I was born in 1998. Here is Mr Kirby's statement. I am pleased to offer a message of solidarity and support to the community and members of Cambodia Laos, Vietnam and Burma, who have established themselves and their families in Australia. I am pleased to do this through the Compature Ground Cultural Centre. I do it with a sense of the love that is owed to fellow human beings who are or whose re relatives have been refugees arriving in Australia. The Australian community over its history has reached out to and offer support for People who have well-found fear of persecutions on the grounds of their faith, religion or other attributes that have made them fearful of return to their countries of original nationality. It is in such circumstance that the Refugee Convention and the New York Protocol has been adopted to provide shelter, asylum and support so that people can live without fear, want for food, shelter and safety that is every human being's birth rights. Between 1993 to 1996, in accordance with the Paris Peace Accords, I had the honor to be appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations as his special representative for human rights in Cambodia. I retired from that position upon my appointment as a Justice of the High Court of Australia. I will never forget the people of Cambodia, including those of the Cambodia Ground community, and others of minority ethnicity. During the celebration of Refugee Week, I send a message of encouragement and respect. 
I thank Solitaire Air for work he had undertaken in Australia and elsewhere to protect and support refugees who have come to Australia. I'm hoping that our country will embark on a new policy of loving kindness for all people who are refugees, no matter what their status may be. Please accept my message of encouragement and admiration. Yours sincerely, Michael Kirby. Thank you. Thank you, and that's a very special message from Michael Kirby. So, Christina, um, I'd like to ask you, so what challenges did you experience growing up with parents who were refugees, and how has that helped shape you as a young person? So my, my, both of my parents, one of them are from Cambodia, one of them is from Khmer Gram, which is now known as South Vietnam. Um, I think the most struggle is language, like struggling to speak English. Everything, you know, everywhere is like you need to know how to speak English and also the culture. So I grew up reading the letters for them, translating everything for them, trying my best to translate, even though I was like seven or eight years old. Um, so yeah, the most struggle is English. Um, and then I try to like educate myself so that I can help them with everything to need. Until now, they have worked so hard for me as well. Like they, you know, provide me with education. So I took a lot of education, and to where I am now, I'm like thankful for them because they've, you know, been through so much through like, you know, working so hard and like trying to, you know, understand how Australia is and yeah, like that. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. That's a beautiful. <laughs> That's a beautiful example of how the experience of refugees is not just the people themselves, but it's the broader family and it's the community. And connecting in that way is all part of the, the growing and the healing. So thank you. Thank you. And it is wonderful to hear from the voice of uh, the youth. I love how I still get called a youth member um, in my, oh, well, I won't reveal how old I am, but, um, but it is lovely to see genuinely young, engaged people um, participating and advocating for these causes. I'm now going to ask a question. We have um, a very esteemed panel, very well educated, broad range of experience, and I think education is a running theme as a way in which we, as just as people living here and growing up in Australia, whether we are refugees or whether we are from any other community, education is a powerful tool. I myself am involved in education as a teacher, so we know it's a powerful tool to not just make ourselves um, more uh, enriched and empowered, but certainly to enrich our families and communities. So I would like to ask our two esteemed lawyers on the panel, Mr. Trevo first, your experience here in Australia, and of course your sense of connection um, and how you have been able to access education, perhaps any sort of the struggles or challenges, but how has that been able to enrich and empower you and perhaps strengthen your voice as a member of the Vietnamese community? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, first I'd like to acknowledge all the community leaders here, the um, Lord Mayor, and I'd like to thank the Laos uh, community for inviting me here, and also ASEAN, Australian Southeast Asian Network. Um, thanks for inviting us here today as um, uh, former refugees or recent uh, refugees. Usually you can see like uh, on TV or, or newspapers, like when you um, talk about refugees, it's always on a boat or uh, in a, uh, a refugee hostel. And I'm very honoured uh, to be here and thank you for the invitation of you. Very honoured to be here like as a a former refugee and instead of being on a boat we are on the stage with all the um, other refugees and thank you and um, just like to before answer just my um, yeah my uh, dad was uh, a hel helicopter pilot trained uh, in America and he was in the war and uh, so when he when uh, Saigon fell in 1975 um, he was captured and as a prisoner of war for seven years and uh, after he came out, we uh, escaped. The first time was unsuccessful. The second time it was uh, successful through boat uh, from 1982 um, for a few days on the sea to Malaysia. And uh, then from Malaysia, we were there for a few months and we flew to Endobo Hostel, which is near Kuji. Stayed there for a few months and we um, uh, resided in, um, in Maripil. So uh, when I grew up, I. Um, well, yeah, I struggled um, uh, going to school because I didn't go to school in uh, in Vietnam, and I went straight to Year One, 
And uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I struggled and I actually repeated a year. And uh, it's uh, something that uh, actually not many people know, but it actually one of the things that got me to really try harder after, like, because uh, I was a little bit embarrassed that I um, came here, didn't understand, and uh, had to repeat. And then from there, uh, I tr uh, tried to study really hard. I had a few problems, of course, like uh, a lot of my uh, peers were also refugees. And, uh, and for us, we drew pictures like uh, you can see uh, small boats, flimsy boats on the high seas, and then we can see soldiers and all that. But uh, when we look at other Australian kids, they'll be drawing things like cars and you know, houses and, and, and animals and all that. And we thought it was normal to draw boats and soldiers and all that. But now when I think of it, it was really a reflection of our youth. And um, and so, uh, yeah, grew, grew up. And then after that, uh, of course, uh, during that period of time, it was very difficult, 80s, 90s, for refugees settling in this new country. And I studied um, commerce law. And uh, uh, my dad was involved in the Vietnamese community. He was, uh, um, yeah, he was the former president of the Vietnamese community in New South Wales in Australia, Mr. Kung Bo. He was here before, but um, had to go to a meeting. And then uh, I, uh, I wasn't very interested in the uh, Vietnamese community when I grew up, but as I grew up, I thought it was so important. Uh, we are refugees. And uh, when, when I went to law school in Sydney, I, I didn't realize it, but I actually, uh, from now, I, I felt, um, I felt uh, this place. I felt I didn't belong, uh, but I got through it, luckily. And when I got to the community in Bonnerig and Cameraman and all that, I felt so, so at home. It was like uh, uh, I think a fish back in, in the um, pond of water. And, uh, and from then I actually got really um, inspired, interested in uh, working with the community because it felt so at home. And, and, uh, and then I also became the uh, president of the Vietnamese community in New South Wales, maximum two terms, and also the uh, uh, president of the Vietnamese community nationwide for maximum two terms. And uh, here, I'm like, you know, still uh, helping out and uh, uh, um, always happy working closely with uh, Su Thay and uh, Moon Sang and um, other communities. And that's more of my story. And, and once again, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing that. And that is remarkable. And again, a, a very similar journey where we, as the children of refugees, we may be I guess we're very successful products of that assimilation process into the wider Australian community, but then we find our reconnection again, and it's very important to do that um, because, of course, family, culture, identity, no matter how much we try to become Australian, we're always going to be um, aware of our language, our heritage, our families are also connected to. I would love to now throw to another youth member on our panel, um, Mike. Joe, when... <laughs> you're very useful too, but we'd like to leave the past. <laughs> uh, we really want to hear your story very soon. Um, Joe, on your experience as a, again, a young Lao um, or a member of the Lao community and your insights into what you perceived as being some of the challenges for your, perhaps, the older generation, but also yourself and what made you reconnect to or connect with the refugee community and working with the Lao community? Somebody. Um, so yeah, my name is Jaywen. Um, uh, I was born and raised in this area, so Denzer Park. So I've been pretty fortunate, you know, to um, have a pretty good upbringing um, and life. So, um, and you know, coming back here is always really nice because I used to always come here every weekend to do, you know, Sunday Dharma school, um, you know, Lao lessons and um, also what, you know, to become a monk, um, really reconnect with, you know, the family and um, just the, you know, the heritage and nationality. Um, so growing up, you know, has been, I guess I was pretty fortunate, um, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, assimilating to, you know, you know being Australian, and my mum also tried to, uh, you know, to do that as well. You know, we, we never always had Lao food when we were growing up, we also had, you know, we made pizzas and had all of that. Um, so I was pretty fortunate, um, and to be raised in the area um, was, you know, really good to have, I guess, what you call normal friends. <laughs> And really, kind of <laughs> integrate. Not saying I'm not normal. <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> and I guess back into the question about you know education and everything was pretty fortunate that 
Um, I didn't do things that you know my parents wanted me to do. I wasn't forced to do um, anything I didn't want to do. So they were always very supportive of me. Um, and yeah, it's yeah, it's nice. Um, and so this year I competed in um, the Great Australian Bake Off. It's a TV show. Um, and I mean, it was a, yeah, it was a really good opportunity. Um, Australian people were very diverse, so it's nice to have someone that's Australian but not white. So I could show them what, um, you know, put a Southeast Asian or Asian spin onto my baked goods and really show how you can really um, change Western food. Um, and I guess baking and cooking is a way of expressing yourself. So you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, you, you might not be able to speak the language, but you can, either, you can still sit on the same table and um, share food, you know, share a nice bottle of fur, and it's still a nice way of expressing yourself and a story. Um, so obviously on the show, every, every you know, Everything you make had a, a backstory to it, um, and you know, shared a story of where I've come from, um, where I'm going, um, and yeah, I was pretty pretty proud of that experience as well. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> now we're very fortunate to have Paul Nim here, um, and Paul, of course, is an ex-member of Parliament from Cambodia, recent asylum seeker. So I'd like to ask you, Paul, what has been your um, experience, it's, it's early days for you coming here, but of course you were a representative of people back in Cambodia, and then you've been through turmoil yourself in terms of coming here and, and resettling. What has been some of your experience as a new refugee, and, and how does that, given that there's still turmoil in, back in Cambodia in terms of um, the democracy that we've had, is, of course it's no longer there, but. How do you then reconcile healing with what you've recently experienced? Yeah, that uh, long story. Yeah, first, uh, I would like to introduce, introduce myself. My name is Ngay Ngum. You can call me Paul. I'm elected uh, member of parliament from uh, Cambodia. And uh, our respective party has been resolved, dissolved in uh, 2017. And then the ruling party took all our seat, yeah. So uh, I fled uh, from Cambodia to Australia in the year of uh, our respective party uh, had been dissolved in 2017. And uh, first, I would pay my respect to uh, the ancient of uh, Aborigine and Torres Strait uh, Islander who is on uh, this country thousand years ago. And uh, I'm so appreciated with the uh, Lord Mayor uh, his uh, speech that uh, uh, Paramta City is the, the welcome area uh, to the refugees. But uh, from my point of view, uh, Australia is a welcome place to everyone. Uh, I can say no matter what background you are, but most people here are the same status as refugees. Yeah. And uh, I'm happy yeah, to be here uh, because Australian government, yeah, I can uh, pay my grateful to Australian government that uh, uh, granted the uh, visa in 2020. And uh, yeah, uh, my family here with me. And uh, even we are here, we get a uh, very warm welcome uh, by Australian government, but uh, we also uh, regret to our own country, especially to uh, Cambodian people. Yeah, uh, I can say uh, at the moment Cambodia is one ruling uh, country, yeah, one ruling party country. So uh, it, I can say it is uh, ruling by uh, detector. Uh, it is uh, detectorship uh, ruling, and Cambodian is living in a very worse condition, yeah, very struggle. <laughs> And uh, uh, I'm very sorry yeah, to observe uh, from here, and uh, we are trying our best to uh, reinstate uh, the democracy in Cambodia and human rights. Uh, uh, at the moment, there is, we can say, a fake democratic in Cambodia. Yeah, as you can see, uh, as the result of election in uh, 2018. Yeah, the ruling party CPP took all the seats in the parliament. So uh, there is no no way of a democratic country uh, got only uh, one party elected to the parliament. 
and uh, I'm so sad about it, and I hope uh, the international community will uh, uh, support us to reinstate the democracy in Cambodia. And uh, regarding to, uh, I can say uh, on my own, my fleeting uh, to here, yeah, uh, I'm satisfied, yeah, especially this event, I'm here. I can join a lot of uh, people from uh, other community, and uh, it is a kind of healing, yeah, because, you know, uh, when, when you are here, yeah, you struggle a lot, yeah, especially everyone uh, share experience about struggling about language, uh, about uh, some time of uh, food, but now is, uh, we, as you mentioned, we have a multicultural food, yeah, so it's, it's more easy for us. And that, that's all kind of uh, healing uh, what uh, I'm uh, moving here, that, that's a big move. But uh, anyway, uh, as what I mentioned, that no matter what background you are, but we are a refugee. And uh, I would suggest that uh, we have to unite it yeah, from uh, other nation because we are here Australia, Australian, yeah, we are uh, from other country, a lot of uh, country here. The best way is united, yeah. So, uh, as what I uh, established the Asian, yeah, the Australian uh, Asian network, yeah, is the, the background, the starting background, yeah, to join uh, initiative, yeah. So, I would suggest uh, to other community uh, to join uh, this uh, network and then uh, together is stronger. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you uh, enjoyed listening to our panellists share their incredible stories and insights and experiences. We're just going to ask one final question to each of you and, um, and we hope that it will be, um, I suppose, leaving a sense of where to next or, or answering that question of where to next because this has been an incredible experience, the union or the coming together of all the various communities um, who are not all represented here on the panel. But we'd like to ask each of you, and we might start with um, Dave on this side. Um, Australia has done pretty well for its migrant and refugee community, pretty well. I think um, out of 10, eight, seven, nine, what do you think, nine? So not quite a 10. So the question is, what can we do better for our older communities who are still experiencing and going through their trauma and healing process for our younger or recently arrived um, refugee community? How can we do better as Australians? Can I start first? Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think, so. One thing is this event. Right? We need to connect more. We need to help each other more. We connect within our own cultural community. But if we connect more across cultural and learn and share and support each other more, then I think that will be more as well. I think the government has, and, and thank you, Lord Mayor, for the initiatives that you set out to help. That made tremendous contribution because you don't, as you can see, we have experienced so much hardship. And there's a lot of trauma and a lot of emotional scar. Right? And especially in, that, in our elders, we may sacrifice for the future of the younger generations. So having government recognize, provide fair, equal opportunity and help settle language barrier we all come from different world, but as we all recognize here, we are one Australia. And we need to do more to protect our value, our shared value, our freedom. And we need to be vigilant to protect democracy. And as the war in Ukraine has reminded us, it's very fragile. Right? We should not take it for granted to protect our Australian value. Thank you. So for me, it's the same, um, trying to connect more together with all different you know, nationalities or boards. I would also want like all youth to come together to help out our parents and to also 
let everyone know about our parents' cultures and values and then bring it to Australia and make Australia of like, you know, all together is like, you know, we are one. Um, so yeah, I hope that we can all connect together and bring together together, like everyone together. Thank you. <laughs> same same um, question. Yeah, like um, of course, I think uh, we have to we have to learn from the um, the past, like our elders, and from other communities, from our, uh, other ethnic communities, and um, and I think what's happening in the, the one thing that can happen in, in one part of the world can happen to to us, like say whether it's in Ukraine or Russia or China or Vietnam, it can happen here, especially um, after the pandemic. You can see that uh, one thing that can happen well, um, in one part of the world, like it can happen anywhere else in the world. And I think very importantly is that, especially where we are uh, in terms of Australia, in terms of uh, geography, geography, like I think um, we need to, to speak out, uh, just say, because if, if we see something wrong or something needs to be improved, we need to work together and voice our concerns. Because if we don't do that, then then um, the, the, the thing that's wrong or the dictator, whatever it is, around in, you know, in one part of the world, we get stronger and stronger. So I think the main thing is if we see something that's wrong or need to improve, we need to, to find a solution or or work together, just like today. And I think today's initiative is very good, like you know, bringing people together, uh, being part of the solution and finding solution and uh, having ideas like this. And this is also, I think, a healing uh, uh, process. Like, you know, uh, because a lot of times we never get a chance to talk about our experiences or as refugees and all that. And by hearing this, like, I think um, we understand other people and their stories. And sometimes we can relate to it and sometimes we can understand it. And uh, it just makes us better, and uh, it's a healing process. And, uh, and once again, thank you for inviting me. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, again, I can say maybe I'm the youngest refugee in this hall. Because <laughs> I've lived uh, here in uh, 2017, I'm just about five years. And I am healing by the senior. Yeah, you are healing me. Yeah, as I, I know, uh, as what our uh, senior uh, speech uh, in uh, his first uh, speech, uh, that uh, when he arrived here, we struggle a lot. So uh, everyone need healing. Yeah, and uh, I learned a lot uh, from uh, all of you, especially uh, uh, the senior uh, from uh, Cambodian community, uh, my crop community. Yeah, from uh, the Mang, from uh, Wat, from Lao Khamthi, uh, Vietnamese Khamthi, uh, Bumia, uh, I met uh, Syrian yeah, community, yeah, build, building a lot of friendship. Yeah, that's a very important healing because we are living in a very big society. Yeah. So uh, as what I mentioned, together is stronger. Yeah, we have to build more and more. Uh, bigger, greater network is our uh, our goal or our duty yeah, to go to uh, uh, make uh, Australian value. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, I would probably say uh, more diversity in Parliament so you can better understand the needs of the community, um, but also increase multicultural services. Um, I think one of the things we've probably learned from COVID is that not everyone speaks English, um, and not everyone gets the news from you know, ABC or whatever. Um, you know, people get the news from a variety of sources, and I think something that was an issue was um, not, a, not a lot of people understood um, what was happening, or the, the, the rules or the restrictions. And I think something I love seeing was there was a lot of people, like volunteers, coming out and translating at their own will, you know, the news, so other people who can't understand can have that opportunity to, to understand. Um, so I think increased services, you know, multicultural um, services or the news um, would be really, really good. I like to say, to make it better for the future, I would say that we need more bilingual helpers 
in the community, in the government, because they all refugees in a Lao community. They don't understand much the concept, you know, and they don't read, they don't understand, they only listen to passing on through ears, you know, and mouth. They don't read, they don't understand the whole thing. So there is, there is a need to improve the uh, multicultural services. And now we are very happy. The Lao, myself, and the community is very happy that ASEAN had come up and existed. So we need more unity among us, among Australians, not only refugees. We need to work together to strengthen Australian values in our community, especially to protect our temples, our institutions from foreign interference. We need to stress that we have to work together and the Lao community is among the, the we are the smallest among other groups and we need to work with other people and we are happy to do so and thank you for your leadership to create the uh, ASEAN network and we hope that we can continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm probably going to repeat a bit of what you said but I um, I've actually worked as a public servant in different roles for over 20 years and the one thing that I've seen is the incredible support that communities give each other and it's very it's very common that the community work is delivered within your own communities and and as some of you have mentioned one of those challenges is that there's a lot of repetition so you have one community delivering a, a program here and then on the other side of the suburb you have a, a different language delivering the same same program um, but we're not we're not delivering um, we're effectively as effectively as we could be and that comes down to government I really feel that COVID did teach us a lot about what we are not doing well and that is that government needs to be more supportive in providing a cohesive approach when it comes to delivering programs to support our communities whether or not we're refugees or whoever is in our community whether or not it's delivering english programs delivering legal services delivering health services we need to ensure that everybody knows how to access those services and that those programs are delivered equally for everyone and how um, particularly having worked in the Auburn area for a long time with an incredible number of diverse communities, I see that as one of the things that we really need to build on. And that will help us to have more interrelationships between different language groups, between different cultures and traditions, and it helps to improve our understanding. We are an incredible community. We need more Bake Offs. <laughs> so, because when you first arrived in Australia and the rice wasn't cooked, that's because people never knew how to cook rice. And we need to improve that engagement across our communities. And I'm sure that we are turning a corner um, with our recent election results. And I hope that we see more improvements with the delivery of those services on a federal level as well. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor, and uh, we'll wrap up the panel discussion there. Such an amazing array of stories and experiences, and it really demonstrates diversity and inclusion, because this is a very inclusive panel and wonderful stories that they have shared. Before we move on to the next stage and um, the, the signing, I'd just like to thank my uh, colleague here who's done a wonderful job, Samana, for her... Um, please give a round of applause to Samana. And also please thank again the, the great panel and uh, for coming up and sharing their stories around uh, refugee experiences and healings. Please thank the panel. And just before we move to the next stage, I'd just like to thank uh, the Lao community for sharing their wonderful hall. It's a very wonderful walk, welcome and warm experience. And I'd like to also thank uh, Mr. Sawate Ek for his wonderful leadership over many years. For
for human rights and justice and in inclusion. So thank you, Suase. And back to you, Simona. Okay, in closing, we are going to be moving to the signing of the joint statement. So I would like to...